Welcome back. So uh, this week, our lesson is going to be lesson 21, and it has to do with primary and secondary sources for information. Last week, I hope you enjoyed our show um, that had to do with famous letters. Um, and letters are part of what I would call primary sources. So today, we're, uh, we're going to look at these two types of sources, especially if you're doing any research. So for any papers, whether you're online or you're in a library, or if you're interviewing people and things like that, you want to look for primary sources. And we're going to show you a short video to start with that defines those two terms. So on I, I think that's, we should show, show the video first, and then we'll talk about what it says. The content of your research project will be made up of primary and secondary sources. Primary and secondary sources come in many different formats, and there are benefits for referencing both types in your assignment. It can be difficult to figure out if a source is considered primary or secondary, but don't worry because we'll explain the differences here so that you can decide which are best to use in your assignment. Primary sources are first-hand accounts of an event, topic, or historical time period. Anything that contains original information on a topic is considered a primary source. Examples of primary sources include things like letters or personal diaries or journals, original photographs, speeches, newspaper reports, creative works like paintings, plays, and music, and research data or surveys. It's a good idea to use primary sources in research papers because it allows you to form your own argument to defend your thesis, since the information you're using is unfiltered by another person's point of view. You're able to critique an original work using your own ideas. Secondary sources interpret, critique, or analyze primary sources. It is information that is created or published from primary sources. Examples of secondary sources include things like textbooks, essays or reviews, encyclopedias, newspaper articles that analyze or discuss events and ideas, and criticisms and commentaries. It's a good idea to use secondary sources in research papers because you can learn about new perspectives that you may not have even considered, and they can also strengthen your own argument in the assignment. For example, if you're writing a history paper about how the diversity of a city shifted during a certain time period, you could use data from the U.S. Census Bureau to compare populations across the decades. This type of information would be considered a primary source, as it's data that's simply been collected and compiled. There is no analysis. That's what you'll be doing in the paper. For the same topic, you could also use an article from a newspaper that reviews the data and draws conclusions or analysis from it such as other ways in which the population might change or grow over time. Some sources, like scholarly journals and newspapers, can serve as both a primary and a secondary source, depending on which article you're reading. Articles that include things like eyewitness accounts or interviews and are published close to the time of the event you're researching would be a primary source. Articles that are published after the fact and include analysis or critiques are secondary sources. Primary and secondary sources can both strengthen and improve your research immensely by providing you with information to create an argument and defend your thesis statement. Now that you know how to differentiate between them, try using them in your own assignment. Okay, so that, that gives you a, a little example of what we're talking about. And why do we care? Well, it's we can't always be at an event, especially a historical event. So we have to rely on the different things that are created by the people who were there. So 
A few of the things that I'm going to show you today are photographs. So on a daily basis, if you're taking photos on your cell phone, for instance, which is, a, you know, we're doing things so much differently now, but with your, with the old, in the old days, if you had a really good camera, it also dated the photograph for you. Nowadays, if you have photos that are on your cell phone, it might be a good idea if there's a specific photo that you want to keep to print it off with the date on it. If you have boxes of photographs at home, I please beg you to find your, your oldest relative or the most, uh, the one that keeps your family tree and put the, the name of the persons in the photo and hopefully the, close to the time period when the photo was taken because it really, really can make a difference for um, not only family members, but people who are looking historically backwards to try to understand different things such as when when did women wear these bustiers and things like that. So um, for researchers, it's very important that you have the name and the date of the people in the photo. And always remember when you're looking at a photo, there's that third important person. It's the photographer who took the photo. Um, so those things when you're doing research are very, very important. And I'm going to show you some interesting photos that I think you'll enjoy. Another thing that is considered um, a primary source would be um, things that are things considered a, the documents, I guess, um, like the Constitution. The Constitution is important for what it says, but if you also think about it, whether we're talking about the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence or things like that, you get signatures of the people who agreed to the document. You also, documents usually have a date on them um, and the signatures say, prove that those people were there in the room at the time. Um, and they often, nowadays, if you see a document, it could be minutes to certain meetings that are held be, that a secretary keeps track of. And um, it, it could be police reports things that are written when, say, a, an accident happens or things like, such as that. So uh, there is the time element of when the document is produced that makes it a primary document. Um, and um, so documents are important. Also, as an unusual thing that you may not have thought of, if you're a person that keeps a calendar on your kitchen wall or near your, your desk, and you're writing down all the appointments you have for the week, or you're um, keeping track of certain things that happen on a certain day, it gives a record. And it's been shown at some of the committee um, confirmations for people in government, you know, when they're going up and they're being vetted, you know, what happened to you on such and such a day and were you there? Um, calendars can be entered as legal documents and they would be considered primary sources because it's a calendar that that particular person has kept faithfully. It's not, uh, diaries too would be considered a primary document but um, they're not as reliable, by, reliable because if you've ever kept a diary, I'm sure you've, you've filled in when you didn't fill it in daily. Some people are, are meticulous about keeping a diary, but others, uh, they go back a couple of days and say, oh yeah, I was there on Tuesday, I was there on Wednesday. So it's not exactly accurate, but it is you that's keeping the diary. So they, they kind of, um, it's a primary document, I'll, I'll agree with that. Maps are considered dire, um, primary, di dire, yeah, primary sources because in the old days when surveyors came through, they were actually really great um, artists. And I'm gonna show you a few of the older maps that um, show our New England um, land area and you'll be surprised perhaps by some of the things that have, were placed in by certain uh, map makers. There are a lot of different um, primary and secondary sources. Most of the things I've gotten today I did get online. Some of them I have in my own records from the Massachusetts, uh, from the North Adams Historical Society when I was the curator for 
um, the society. I, I made copies or I sought out things on my own. So um, I'm going to share some of those with you. Today, what uh, would perhaps be a primary document that you might not think of is if you're using your own computer at home and something goes haywire, they usually ask you to take a screenshot of your screen when something's not working correctly. And then that can be emailed um, to the person that's trying to tell, help you. It's easier to see what's happening on your screen than for us to sometimes describe it to a tech person. But when they see the screenshot, they go, oh, OK, I've seen that. And they can give you some help. But that would be, again, sort of a photograph. But it's now called a screenshot of your um, computer screen. So I would even consider that a primary document in this day and age. What makes something a secondary document is when these things that I've mentioned are then put into another form. They're used a, secondary a second time. And um, so many things that, um, like magazines use photographs, textbooks, magazines and textbooks would be considered secondary um, sources because they're reusing a photograph, a document um, in some cases. Sometimes they're getting actually primary sources if it's a first time um, nonfiction article that someone is writing where they've interviewed someone where that, per, that uh, an interview is considered a primary document. So we've, we've had a lot of um, uh, I don't even know what to call it, whether it's news or noise lately about an interview that Oprah Winfrey did and, and it was aired on the 60 Minutes on Sunday with Meghan Markle and Harry um, of the royal family. And so that interview is them saying what it was like for them in a certain um, lifestyle at the royal um, castle in Windsor in the United Kingdom. So interviews can be very powerful um, to give an example, give one person account or two, meaning the couple, um, on something that happened to them personally. And then um, it can be discussed later. So what I'd like to do, uh, first of all, I'm going to show you some of the examples I've given you. And they're going to be primary sources. So let me, I'll meet you over at the whiteboard. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about is Life Magazine. Life Magazine has always been um, a magazine that people have appreciated for the photos that have been kept um, and then published. So in a sense, Life Magazine is a secondary source. But for this particular um, image, this is Martin Luther King and the people that turned out in Washington. And there is always, it says, the March on Washington, Power to the People. That was for their, um, their cover for that um, time. And we know whoever took the picture of Martin Luther King that day was there. And it's an, an accurate portrayal of what was happening that day in Washington, DC. When Life then uses that photo, and puts it into their magazine as a cover photo, then you've got a secondary source. The, the idea is you want to trust that it wasn't photoshopped, it wasn't um, changed in some way, and that's the original picture. And Life Magazine usually had um, a good reputation for not messing with the photos that it um, had in its magazine. So, Let's continue. So I'm just going to show you this, this idea here. With a primary source, time is a very important thing. If you have a source that happened on the day that something happened, there, then you've got 
a primary source. It's the original day, it's the original experience, it's a photo, it's a letter, it's a document written at a certain time and also perhaps a certain place. It has signatures. Um, there's some verification that this is an accurate account of what happened that day. So time is very important. I mentioned that um, anything that you sign can be um, looked at as a primary document. This was, I found, very interesting when I went looking. This is an arrest report for O.J. Simpson when he was arrested for um, armed robbery. I don't know if any of you recall this, but O.J. Simpson was tried for murder of his wife, and he got acquitted. But later on, he was arrested going into a hotel with some friends of his, and he claimed on his arrest report the following. It says, at approximately 1938 hours on September 13th, 2007, the LVMPD received a call reporting a robbery had occurred at the Sahara, the police station, hotel, and casino in room 1203. The police, un, un, um, un, the, the police uniformed officers were dispatched to make contact with the victim who verbally identified himself as Alfred Birdsley. Upon their arrival, the officers contacted three suspects three subjects at room 1203, Bruce Fromm, Alfred Birdsley, and Thomas Riccio. Among the initial arriving officers were Officer Lewis and Officer Tucker. The officers received an explanation about the robbery and then briefed their supervisor, Sergeant Dale, who contacted Sergeant Hunt of the robbery section and requested that detectives respond and the robbery was reported. Um, Let's see. So this is an arrest report. And the person who is arrested is Simpson Orenthal James, O.J. Simpson. And the charge was robbery with a deadly weapon, assault with a deadly, deadly weapon, burglary with a deadly weapon, and conspiracy to commit a crime. And it gives his age, his name, San Francisco, and the signature of the officers who had arrested him. And it ended up that this actually was what O.J. Simpson was put in jail for um, because the people with him, he claimed he didn't know that they had whip weapons with them. Um, but any of us who've been stopped and arrested for anything, unfortunately, you have to, you have to sign you know, that you, what your side of the story is too. But this was the reporting officers um, police report. And um, again, it's an official document. People can look it up and then they can uh, say this is what happened on what day, what time, things like that. So that's a primary document. The next thing I'd like to show you are some things, uh, some maps, some old maps of our area, New England. Um, this is the way the map is read. But if you want, if you really think about it, this is what our coast we're more used to. This would be Cape Cod down here. And, um, but I'll put it this way just to explain a couple of things. This map um, is a map that was always a little controversial, not a big to do, but it was done by one map maker who said, as you came this way into New England and you got to the White Hills of Vermont, of um, New Hampshire, he put White Hills and then a map started generating where this, the hills were described as the wine hills. Not a big difference, but it's certainly wine and white are not the same. I think of wine as being red. I know it is white too, but it just seems strange to me and I've always wondered why would they change it uh, for the American version, 
what he, he origi his original intent was that it was the White Hills and somehow or other this map got changed and somewhere around here um, it got on some maps it says wine and some maps it says white. Uh, but you can see all the rivers that are flowing through um, our New England area. But again, you can't mistake Cape Cod is right there. But that's one of the earliest maps that we know of. And that would be a primary source also. Here's another version of this map um, done by a different map maker. This one um, is quite colorful. This one also includes a lot of the Indian names. We have the Ashwiltecook Trail and things like that. Well, this one's actually mentoring the Wampanoag down in Connecticut, um, Pequot too. And this again is the Cape here. Um, but again, they, they're, very, they're almost works of art. If you find an original map, um, they, they are quite expensive. They're considered artwork also. Um, but we can see the different things that they're, the different way that names have changed over the years. Different people who start settling them, name them one thing as, as they move on, other people uh, come in. Mountains are shown on some of these, definitely the rivers. I remember one time we had the, the first map I showed you up in the, new, in the North Adams Historical Society when we were down at Heritage Park, and a man came in and told me that, um, and he had been in Vietnam, and he said he found it very interesting to look at the old map of New, of New England because he said it also, it looks somewhat like what it was like over in Vietnam. And they traveled by boat a lot of times in Vietnam because of all the rivers. And he said it must have been like that when Fort Massachusetts, um, in the time of Fort Massachusetts in the 1700s, they must have traveled by many of the rivers throughout New England at the time. Because think about it, you're not, it's easier to travel um, in a canoe than it, it would be to go through um, over land at times. So, um, but just be aware of these, these old maps because they're quite interesting and actually very pretty. This is that same map, but um, further back. You can actually see some of the forts back here um, as you move across New, uh, New England into um, the various uh, places. Again, a lot of fancy artwork drawn. You have your regular map things, a compass, um, usually a legend. Um, but again, old maps are primary documents. Another thing that is definitely a primary document is something that has to do with um, the architectural drawings and blueprints. What did things look like in our North Adams uh, industrial community? This is actually a drawing of the Sampson shoe mill, the shoe factory actually, uh, and it's no longer there. It would have been across from Mass Mocha. Perhaps um, I would say it's, it could have been a little bit north of where the Social Security office is now, across from the main gate of Mass Mocha. But it shows the inside interior um, architectural drawing. And what's interesting about this map um, that I got at City Hall is it shows where the Chinese were actually living in 1870. There's a whole story about the Chinese workers that came to North Adams and lived in the mill to break a strike of Canadian, French Canadian workers that refused to work anymore without better pay. And um, Mr. Chase, a, a, a man who worked for uh, Mr. Sampson, went out to California and brought Chinese back to North Adams. And it was quite a big to-do. 
and there were newspaper accounts. Now, the newspaper accounts that day, I would say, were primary sources because they were the people that their their interviews with people who saw the Chinese get off the the railroad at where um, the Breen Center is now. They reported seeing these Chinese workers who were children, the oldest was 15, walking down Marshall Street from that site where the Breen Center is there. Um, and Mr. Chase was wearing six shooters. He had, he had um, guns on both hips to prevent the strikers, that mostly Canadian French were along the roads, jeering at them, throwing things at them, because they were going to take away their work, their, their jobs, and they were going to come in. And they, they stayed here for about 10 years. And there's um, quite a few accounts about what happened to them. And, that, and after 10 years, they basically moved out of the area. Some went to Boston, some went to New York. So that's a whole story, too. But this is actually showing where they lived in the mill. Um, which is kind of an interesting thing. It's been drawn by an architect, and then it's been filled in by hand from um, who knows who, but it's, an, it's a document, a primary document, and it says S.F. Sampson Shoe Factory. So very kind of an interesting architectural map. The other thing that happens in, in looking for sources of information. Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper was a very um, prominent, very reliable source. This shows some of the Chinese working in that shoe factory. It was a newspaper that, um, and, it ha and, and because, it's, it, because it's dated, because it's a hand-drawn sketch, it's reprinted, but it's, it's an original sketch of a person who went into the mill and saw them working. It's been printed on July 9th, 1870. Obviously, this is a photocopy that I made of, of the actual um, drawing that was in Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. But remember, this is like before photography at times. So you have to have some kind of representation of what it looked like. Is it completely accurate? Not, not maybe, I don't know. I am, we have, it's questionable. But you can almost, you have to assume this is one of the white men that, uh, it could have been Mr. Chase, who was the supervisor for Mr. Sampson. And then these are obviously, stereotypically, um, the Chinese. Now, some of them are where, have the cue, they call it. They have their hair pulled back into like a pigtail. Um, we also have photographs of the Chinese when they got here because they went to um, the first congregational church and a woman named Fanny Burlingame um, actually paid for them to get Western type clothing. And there are pictures of them when they first came, how they looked, and then they have them actually wearing Western type clothing so that they could get other positions after they got settled here, learned the language, and um, maybe wanted to move on and not just work in the shoe mill later on. So it's, it's a whole story. It's very interesting if you haven't heard of it. There's a lot of good books, and I'll show you a couple of those. But this would be a primary document, too. And this was my example of a, of a calendar. This was last year's. Turn to any page. And, and I've written down, like, maybe doctor's appointments, dentists, uh, check on the bunny <laughs> for, for grandchildren. But it's what you, what you do every month daily that you're keeping as a document. You can sort of place where you were on a particular day. The next thing I'd like to show you are photographs. So photographs can be very helpful when you're trying to understand uh, a community and how it develops. This, I guess, is too heavy. This one's uh, been war pretty war. But this is a soccer team. Um, and there is a Neville 
in this picture. And the story about this soccer team is that all of the mills in North Adams, the men who owned the mills, they were the, there was the Sampson mill, there was the Arnold Print Works, um, there, there were different mills. They had this thing going on uh, that I think, you know, somebody who wants to write a book would find it very interesting. They all loved to play soccer. There's the kid in the front who's probably the mascot. He's got a soccer ball in his hand. But the thing is, is they actually, the, the owners of the mills sought out people who were immigrants who could come to this country who were good soccer players. And one of the Nevilles, he's up here, um, and I'm very fortunate because someone wrote all the names on the back of this. So I can actually find different men, and a lot of them are from Scotland. Um, Jack Neville, Tommy Thompson, Chick Hayes, the mascot is Davy Reed, Bill Anderson, Tom Neville, there's a couple of Nevilles, Mark Spink, Alex Thompson, Jack Deans, Jim Kirkland, Jack Thology, or Tolmy, uh, Jim Neville, Alex Mazier, and Robert Neville um, in 1910. So this is the sort of thing, if you're researching, it's, this is like gold. When you find the picture and you've got the names and you can identify the different people that are playing. Um, and um, a lot of them also were, Strong Hewitt was part of this mix of soccer games every weekend to see whose team was a better soccer player. So it was not football, it was the real football, <laughs> let me say it that way. The soccer teams in North Adams were very, very popular at the time. Here's another primary uh, document. This is a, gr a group of women workers. I'll have to hold this one too. Um, and this, these women worked at the Mayflower plant and that, um, that mill is no longer there. It's actually on the street off of River Street by Cascade Paper Company. And these women, the, the owner is right here. <laughs> and my grandmother's up here. She worked in that mill. After she graduated from eighth grade, she went to work for, um, um, for the rest of her life. And, and she, this is her sort of class picture, which I find fascinating that the mill workers, uh, these women are older workers. I've got some other sh pictures that I'll show you that uh, were taken by a professional photographer who took pictures of the children workers. But if you see a lot of my, this is my grandmother, whoops, right here. Where is she? Right here. Um, but these are older women, um, not, not children, but they were the workers that were in the Mayflower Mill that has been torn down. And um, it's through, like, as I say, from River Street to Cascade, whatever that street is. I can't remember it right now. Um, so we know a little bit about who was working in that mill. Here is a cotton mill. And we get to see the machinery and things like that from photographs. This was taken by someone on a particular day. People are not being staged. That's, that's what they wore. Imagine the wear, wa working in those long dresses in those hot mills um, to wrap the, that's a cloth, one of the cloth mills. I think it's Arnold Printworks. And these places are just all gone. This is Pedersini's Diner. That's uh, my grandfather's diner uh, was torn down to build the police station where it is now. And that was one of his first diners. I, I think that, and the chairs are kind of like school ch chairs now. I thought that was kind of, they have the table and chairs, but these, oops, let me show it over here. Maybe if we can back up a little bit, you'll see that there's like a chair with like one person could sit and there's a table right there. They're, they look like school, yeah, uh, thank you. That, they look like that's the style for that to eat off of just that one single chair. Interesting stuff. Here's a, a, a butcher shop. I don't know if this is Bateman's, so I'm not sure but it's uh, another 
classic kind of photo in the 40s. Class pictures are also primary sources. This one has the name. This one's, I think, interesting because it is Ho the Houghtonville Grammar School. Now, Houghtonville is where I live. It used to be a separate section. There's Clarksburg, there's North Adams. This was Houghtonville, and Clarksburg was divided in, from Houghtonville to uh, Briggsville, which is on the other side of town, and then it was like the middle section. I don't, they also had a separate school along Middle Road, but this is Houghtonville, and this is uh, a class of, in 1926, 1927. And I'll read some of the names. You have um, Louis Lapine, Mary Burrell, Catherine Osborne, Gertrude Davin, Marie Senecal, Yolanda Mazinski, Guido Mazzelli, Sterling Battis, Harvey Daniels, um, Ruth Murphy, Mary Bona, Zane Oaks, Jean McClagan, Dorothy Daniels, Pauline Falcon, Esther Burrell, um, Bert McClagan, Babe Gilbert, Harry Dobb, Bob Neville, Ray Morocco, Bud Osborne, Bill Murphy, Angelo Burrell, and Gordon Oaks. These are people that are grandparents of my friends, my age. So these are them as young children. And this school was up the street from my house on Houghton Street. It's now a four apartment um, residence for, for a family, but it was the school on Houghtonville. It was, it was a, a legal destination uh, for, for going to school. Houghtonville Grammar School, the third and fourth grades. Um, now, these photos that I'm going to put up were taken by a Mr. Hines, who was a professional photographer. And you probably have seen, especially the one I'm going to put up in the middle. These, he came to different New England towns and took pictures of children who were working. After he did that, um, they absolute, this one became the cover of a book that was then published about his children who were workers. And you'll notice from a lot of these, like, like this one too especially, these are children. These are little kids. And a lot of them are barefoot. So can you imagine going in, working a, a 12, a, at least a 12-hour day, barefoot with the long clothes? These kids are so small, they have to climb up on the machine to change the, the bobbins and the threads and things like that. So you can imagine they, there were many injuries that, uh, for these children that were working those long hours. They definitely were not in school. They were working, and um, the thing I find interesting, though, is they're smiling. A lot of the pictures, they're all having a great old time, the, and the hats, they're not baseball hats, they're caps a lot of times, but it gives you a whole different idea of what it was like for these kids to be working. And um, I, I remember talking to a few senior citizens about what it was like for them to be working in the mills, and they said it was just so loud when, you, when the machines were all on, all um, running, it was just so loud. And in the ones that were weaving, the, the, um, the shuttle would hit, it hit, and if you've seen a real shuttle, um, they have metal tips to them, and as they hit against the side of the wall and get sent back like a rocket, um, it's a horrible, loud sound. I don't think we are, we are aware of it. We've seen the pictures of it, but to hear it, um, they said that was the thing they remembered most, is how loud it was in there. You didn't talk to anybody because you wouldn't have been able to hear them even if they were right next to you. So, um, but these were pictures taken by Mr. Hines, and uh, as I say, this is the cover of the book that you will um, you can you can purchase if you see that girl that's the book that text talks about the child labor 
during the time in North Adams and the surrounding area. So a few other things that we can call primary documents. Um, this is something that I found when I was researching some different primary documents that uh, this was not exactly local, but I think it's relevant for today. Uh, things are, that are posters or what are called broadsides are, and I'll read this to you because it's, it's very small. Um, this was from Dr. Fancher, who actually lived, oh, thank you, I can see it. Thank you very much for enlarging that. Dr. Fancher was a doctor in Rhode Island, and um, I believe it was 18, well, something I didn't know about smallpox was that I knew about smallpox coming and, it, and hitting our, the Native Americans when the white settlers came in from Europe and whatnot, because they it had never been here before. But I did not know that smallpox was a cyclical disease, that once you did reach herd immunity in a population, it didn't come back around from, from the, the, it kind of died down for like 150 years or more, and then it came back on other boats coming into the country. Well, Dr. Fancher in Rhode Island actually had a slave who when smallpox came back into the country, the slave had told him he knew what this was based on what the symptoms were for people who were contracting the smallpox. And he's the one that told the doctor about the use of live smallpox germs being, in, being a, a vaccination, an inoculation, a small little bit of smallpox would give you a, antibodies and you wouldn't die from it. You'd, you'd get sick, but you wouldn't die from it. So he, Dr. Fancher actually vaccinated his own six-year-old son and the slave who told him about it and the slave's son. And, um, and so people, he did save a lot of lives with people after they realized they didn't get, they didn't die, and they then got vaccinated. And he put out this broadside. Now a broadside would be, would have been nailed to an outside wall, a board, a tree, a board in the village, somewhere like that. And it's his advice after you've gotten your vaccination on what to do. So I will read what he says. The di Dr. Fancher's rules to be observed during vaccination. The diet needs no deviation from that before inoculation. The little silken paper, paper patch may soon be from the arm detached. Loose sleeves are best and arms kept cool. Children need not be kept from school. In case the in inoculated part should feel uneasy, itch and smart, don't shove up sleeves, nor scratch, nor fret it, but with some salt and water wet it. Don't lift the children by the arm, nor bind it up, t'would do it harm. Cold water safe in every case to wash the patient's hands and face. From work, no patient need abstain, at least in case he feels no pain. Symptoms the eighth day or before, the arm is seldom very sore, nor does it scarcely give disease. The pustules like a mallow's cheese, but none should fail to be inspected. A spurious case can be detected. Persons in any situation, fit subjects are for vaccination. And infants one week old or less, it gives them no uneasiness. It is presumed no prudent mother will vaccinate one child from another. Better to make the business sure or um, the life be spared. It's, it's a, something, I'm sorry, the blooming cheek with dismal scars. Um, children at school should be permitted to go out oftener than usual 
to take the fresh air while under vaccination. So he's a poet besides um, being a doctor type scientist. Um, a few more things that are documents. We have diaries that are primary sources. This one in particular has been very useful in, in this area. It's Norton's Redeemed Captive. R Reverend Norton um, is the, the traveling minister that in 1746 made the mistake of visiting Fort Massachusetts and then um, it was attacked by um, the French and the Abenaki Indians. It's his diary. This, I guess you could call a secondary source because it's been printed from Norton's actual diary. Um, but it is, lucky it was, I have no idea where the actual um, handwritten diary is. It, I hope it's in a museum somewhere. But this is what the first page says. It's uh, a copy of the title picture of title page as originally issued. The Redeemed Captive being a narrative of the taking and carrying into captivity of the Reverend Mr. John Norton when Fort Massachusetts surrendered to a large body of French and Indians on August 20th, 1746, with a particular account of the defense made before the surrender of that fort and the articles of capitulation, etc., together with an account both entertaining and affecting of what Mr. Norton met with and took notice of in his traveling to and while in captivity at Canada until his arrival at Boston on August 16, 1747, written by himself. And this document is from 1748. So it is a primary source, again, not the handwritten version. That would be um, probably worth a lot of money, but I, I, I can't think that it's not considered a primary document. Speeches are also considered primary documents. This was a speech done for the annual commencement in 1835. Um, I'm sorry, Eight, yes. August 19, 1835 at Williams College. Also, any kind of telephone directory that you can find. This one's for 1932, the North Adams District Telephone Directory. And the da Davenons, that's my maiden name, in this book are D apostrophe capital A, Davions, in this book. So there's a few of them. Those are primary documents. I have to tell you about this gentleman. So along with this picture, this is a photograph of my grandfather in the middle, Frank Petersini, and behind him is a, um, a sign that advertises Petersini's Diner, and it was on State Street, and at the first diner he had was across the street where the police station is now, and, um, I'm, and then he had another diner across the street, and he's standing there with two of his friends, and I, I'm sorry, I know one of them is a Mr. Zeiter. Um, the thing that I wanted to say about this picture, my grandfather's father died like three days after he was born, so we never really knew his father. And he didn't, of course. But he came from Russia, Italy. And a lot of people in North Adams also came from Northern Italy. What I found fascinating when I worked with the North Adams Historical Society, we were working upstairs in the North Adams Public Library. And we were going through different um, drawers, closets, things where things had been stored. And we were looking at scrapbooks. Well, the day I was, I was given a scrapbook, and I opened it up, and in the scrapbook was a, was a primary document. It was a petition, and the petition was dated, and the request was, we, the Italian gentlemen of North Adams, wish to petition the city of North Adams. And mind you, it was 1901. That's when the city of North Adams bought the Blackington Mansion from the widow 
of Mr. Blackington and decided to turn it into a public library, not a residence. When, when, it, was going to be, when it was known that it was going to become a library, more than 100 men signed their signature to this petition that I found sitting looking at me. And it had, and it said, we the Italian gentlemen of North Adams wish to petition the city of North Adams to buy Italian books. We are reading men, we just don't read English. And it was, it was fascinating. And the other fascinating thing about it was the city of North Adams first mayor was Mr. Houghton, um, he, he saw to it that there were Italian books purchased by the North Adams Public Library for the Italian people in North Adams to be able to read in their own language until they, they learned uh, English. So I thought that was just an amazing story. Um, so let me get to my secondary sources, So because uh, I'm running out of time. So secondary sources can uh, help you with your research. And there are some secondary sources that I'd like to point out to you. If you're talking about North Adams or New England and you're writing an article for a history class or even English, something that inter interests you locally, this is a book that was written by a teacher in um, the school systems named Jean Jarvie and it she was a teacher in 1926 in the North Adams Public Schools. It's considered a secondary source because it's her using secondary uh, primary sources but she's writing it on um, I, I shouldn't just say that it's a secondary source it is and it isn't. She has written her accounting of what she knew from primary sources. And she used, like, Norton's Redeemed Captive. She draws pictures. She's done some work of her own. But I, in 1926, for me, this is a primary source because it's, it, it gives a lot of her own um, recollections, too. So this is a very good book. It's very good to use for any students that are, um, say, I would say first grade to eighth grade because it's easy. It's an easy read. It's meant to be an easy read where children can read it themselves. So stories from our hills. This one is the book I've, re I've referenced before. It's called Downland. I'm sorry, Dawnland Encounters, and it's by Callaway, Colin G. Callaway. Dawnland Encounters uses a lot of primary sources. It's almost like a Bible to me because it gives you any documentations that um, were done between the Native Americans of New England and the white settlers. And um, it's where, it's, it's in this book that I got the information um, that I told you about Greylock being one of, the, one of their respected chiefs. Um, it's on page 162, and I'll just read a really short paragraph here. It says, the Abenaki village at Misqua on the north end of Lake Champlain was a center of Abenaki independence and resistance to the English. Greylock, two words, established his headquarters near there in the 1720s, and in subsequent conflicts, the village served as a forward base for French and Abenaki forays against the English frontier. And I'll just stop there. But this, this is, I, I believe, things that are in here to be really good primary sources um, that you don't have to hunt down because they're, they talk a lot about formats and all of the um, controversy at that time. And the last one I want to show you, I got to meet this man, Anthony Lee. Um, and it's called The Shoemaker's um, Story, being chiefly about the French-Canadian immigrants, enterprising photographers, rascal Yankees, and Chinese cobblers in a 19th century factory town. So this, I would definitely recommend this if you want to know more about the Chinese. There's a lot of photos. They're, um, they're talking about Samson's Mill. 
They're talking about the ward photos that were taken. He was a very famous photo photographer around the time um, that these, Eng these um, Chinese came to um, New England, and especially North Adams. And I think you'd find these very, very interesting, whether you're French Canadian or Chinese, or you lived in uh, North Adams during that time in the eight, late 1800s or your, or your great grandparents did. So, um, but these books, because they use primary photos and documents, um, they, they present the stories about the past that we were not a part of, but they enrich your understanding of it. it um, it's important to understand that their their primary sources. Again, I'm going to repeat what the the, the video said. Primary sur sources come from a person who's actually there, and then writes about it, or takes a photo, or paints a picture of, of it or a drawing. It's something. It's their pers that person's impression of what actually happened at a certain time at a certain place, and secondary sources collect the primary sources and try to make sense of them. A, a, a sort of a moral thing for me is you don't change anything. You cannot change anything because then you, you've interrupted the history that was originally drawn. Or you, know, um, you, could, you don't Photoshop it to make it look, look better uh, as far as I'm concerned. But, um, Think about what's happening for you, yourself, right now. Um, if you keep your documents, you really need to make sure that it's, it's clear what the day is, what the time is, where you are. And if, if any of you are keeping journals, your own impressions of things can be considered a primary document after you're gone. So um, for your assignment, what I'd like you to look at is some things that have happened to you during this time of COVID. Many places have had plagues in the past. Many places have lived through it, but I'd like you to really give some thought to what, how the, this COVID protocol or the vaccinations or, or a lot of women are, could write stories about becoming the, the, their children's teachers and things like that. It's an experience that we've never been through quite like this before. So everyone has a story to tell. And the more documentation about what happened and how it happened and how people live to cope through it um, will be very beneficial for you to write about, I would say, and also for history. So become a part of history and create your own primary document Take some of those photos off of your cell phone, print them out, document when it happened, how it happened, things like that, and be your own archivist so that it doesn't slip away. We only know what happened in the past by people making a record of it. So um, until, I think that'll, that'll do it for me today. And um, if you're looking around and you find something interesting at a tag sale or something, it could be a postcard or something, um, pay what you can for it, get a bargain, and learn a little bit about history. See you next week.